but I'll introduce firstly Barbara. I've got to find Barbara. Barbara is an experienced community engagement practitioner living and working in South Australia. She holds a Masters of Conflict Management and a background in the development and implementation of community engagement framework models in local government. And Barbara is the author of the Local Government Association Community Engagement Handbook. So Barbara today is going to be talking about creating a culture of effective decision making. So welcome Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, and it's a privilege to be here. I am I'm a big fan of local government, I, I, and I sincerely mean that. I, I really like the, the connection that, um, that we have directly with the community. I think it's the closest one that, you know, across the tiers of government. So um, I, I want to, um, we've got an hour to do um, quite a bit of work, so I'm not going to overwhelm you. But I do want to get you up and moving because I believe you had a big dinner last night, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> How are we all feeling this morning? <laughs> um, hence the sort of bit later start. But um, one of the things that when we talk about um, a culture of effective decision making, there are a number of things that we have to bear in mind when we're looking at culture. Uh, it's, it's, is the culture that is uh, part of the uh, council that you're, you're part of, is it working for you? Is it working for your council? Is it working for your community? And uh, if, you're, if you've been around councils for a, a long time, one of the things that we tend to do is, is become quite used to the culture. Uh, we settle into it. And then when new people come in, when newly elected members come along, um, things get ruffled a little bit, uh, but things then settle back into the way they were in a lot of, a lot of places. So I'm probably going to challenge a few things this morning. Um, I know after some of these sessions I'm not always entirely popular with everybody, but that's okay because you know, part of what I have to do is, is, I guess, raise awareness about things that you might want to consider. So we're going to be talking this morning about um, uh, creating a culture of effective decision making. And in a lot of the training that I do with um, government staff, we talk about sustainable decisions. And we hear that word all over the place. And one of the first things I ask people is, well, what does sustainable mean? <laughs> does anybody, would anybody be able to want to have a go at that at this hour on a Saturday morning? What no. do we mean by sustainable? Long lasting. Long lasting, yeah. Is it good long lasting? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, there's, it, it, the, and anybody else got a... a definition of what sustainability is? I'm not surprised because it, it's a question that I ask and, and very few people can come up with a, you know, a, a, a quick answer. Um, in the training that I do, we look at financial sustainability, environmental sustainability, um, technical and social sustainability. So we look at all those things to make up um, a sustainable decision. I'm not going to talk too much about that this morning. But what I do want to do is, this is what I'm going to be covering this morning. So I'm going to have an opening activity. I'll, I'll, I'll go through that with you in a moment. I'm going to give you an overview of what a focused culture, um, a decision-focused culture is, so that we have something to base our discussions on. Um, we're going to do a cultural check activity. So an opportunity for you, now that you're here, you're not in the chamber, you're not having to be in there making decisions, you can step back and have a look at what, make, what might make up um, uh, your culture. Then we're going to look at a decision process activity and then have a look at um, how do you create a decision, co uh, well, we're going, what are we doing? We're going to do decision process and then a decision making activity. We'll, we'll work with it. Okay, so the first thing that I, I want to do is ask you all to grab a piece of paper and a pen because I'm going to put some stuff up on the board and I need you to write down a list. So, everybody's got a piece of paper. Um, this is, uh, if you can imagine that you're all in the chamber and uh, these six things are all going to happen at the same time. So as I put them up there, I just want you to write them down and then I'll tell you what I'd like you to do with them. So the first thing is that there's shouting from the public gallery. <laughs> write, write that down on your list, yeah, just write that down, shouting from the public gallery. 
Okay, so the next thing is that the ceiling has sprung a leak. There's water pouring into the chamber. Got that one? Yeah. So the next thing is your phone is ringing, although it should be turned off, but it's ringing. <laughs> The next thing is, there is a child, you hear a child crying. You can hear it, you don't know where it is, but you can hear it. Huh? The next one is, a bird has flown into the chambers and it's trapped now, flapping all over the place. one, the, sec the security alarm has gone off in the house next door. So now that you've got all those written down, imagine these are all happening at the same time. What I want you to do is put them in the priority that you would deal with them. What would you do first, what would you do second, and so on. What's the priority? Now, it's all happening at the same time, so I'm going to give you about 40 seconds to put them in priority. What would you do first, what would you do second? <laughs> So now you've got your list and you've, you've sorted it because it's all happening very quickly. You've made your decisions. Yeah, not too much time to think because it's all happening at the same time. Pressure, pressure. What I want you to do now is get up and go and find somebody whose list matches yours exactly. Exactly. Who has exactly the same order that you have? I have to finish, so. So were there any
any matches? Did anybody match? Okay. Okay. So, good. So we've got a few matches. Okay. So, before we talk to the people who've had the matches, uh, what do you think was going on in that activity? We're trying to show you that people just don't think alike. They don't? No. And why don't they think alike? It's hard to find agreement. It's hard to, yeah. We're all the individuals. We're all individuals. What makes us individual? We all have different priorities. Different priorities? Different experiences? What else? Different abilities. Abilities. Talents, different world views, world views. Experience. yeah, experience, yeah, values. values, that's the big one, we, we all have different values, and values are actually what drive your behaviour, so some of the decisions that you are making are based on some of your values, now, um, I could spend time asking people what are your values, um, uh, and again, people, it's not something we think of, but it actually drives your behaviour. So things like fairness, uh, uh, integrity, those are some of the things that, that the sorts of values that um, drive me. Respect is another one. Um, valuing life is another one. So some of those values would have been at play in this activity. Now, let, I want to get back to the people who found the match. So we had a couple of people here. Uh, what, what happened when you found the match? What did you do next? I was in shock. All six points were a match. Yes. That's crazy. I did not expect it. You didn't expect it, so. What you've learned is you're not an individual. So, when you found one another, what happened? We kissed them, mate. Did you keep looking? Yes. Yes. You did keep looking for other matches? It wasn't kind of my observation. What I was watching was, and this happens when people find a match, they just stay together and they talk together. Because now I've found somebody who is exactly like me and agrees with everything I say. We're going to be pals. And that's what happens in the chamber, in life, in the community. People gravitate towards people that are the same as them, think the same as them, because they don't have to argue with them. They can get them, you know, there's agreement. The other people that found matches was that. The same experience or? Yeah, we were, we were really excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and I find that when I'm working with community people in the community, if we're doing a workshop or whatever, people just gravitate towards one another, which then can make it a bit tricky when you're trying to get people to be, to take a step back and look at a whole picture. Because what they then tend to do is look at their little bit. And if they've got people around them agreeing with them, they tend, that tends to galvanise them that they're right, you know. So people then start to take up uh, positions. So um, tell me about, um, so what was the first thing you had on your list, sir? Councillor? Uh, turn the phone turn the, turn the turn phone, the phone off. off. And why did you want to do that? Because it's the quickest thing to fix. Okay. So, and the, and the chap that was your match? What same was the same? Answer. It was because it was the quickest thing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, what was the next thing? Um, noise in the gallery. Noise in the gallery. Um, yeah, in the gallery. And what, 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 we got, what, why did you want to, do, to fix that one? Um, Trying to reduce noise, I suppose. Cockney noises. Okay. So, I'm getting the sense that you don't like noise. <laughs> <laughs> you might sound also a rural council, so. <laughs> How oh, I had to the city. Okay. <laughs> so there's more um, we're, we're learning about you. you the same the reason for dealing with the noise in the gallery? Um, I guess the, dealing with the noise in the gallery was second because you need to bring some form of order to the chamber before you can start to think through dealing with the other. Okay. So same choices, but for different reasons. So even though they're, they've got similarities, even within their similarities, there are differences as well. So that's the sort of thing that's bubbling away in the surface when you're in the chamber. And, and it's, it, it's there. Now that I've, I'm talking about it, you'll, next time you're in the chamber, you'll, you'll be, see more of it. You know? And, and it, it, one of the things I would like to encourage you to do is to be a bit more mindful of that sort of thing going on in the chamber and, and how you might actually either 
feed into it or use it for, for the good. Does, that, does anybody, I, 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 there was a woman told me she was going to suspend everything. Who was that lady? Stop. Yeah. So what, what was your approach? <laughs> Okay. So there's a leader, see, and that's a, a different way. So, um, what do what do people? And, and this is this is this is not to create any any um, angst or anything. But what do people think of that approach? As long as people listen to you, it'll work. If people aren't going to listen because they're panicking for whatever reason, you probably just create a committee, which would then do that. And then you'd have to work on the recommendation. <laughs> I hear a but. What's one of the rules? Yeah, yeah. You, you'd, have to, you'd have to ask the other members for the yeah. 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 Does someone have to move the motion? You know, yeah. The second yeah. Motion, yeah. And then the vote. Point of order. By the time we did all that, yeah. you know, the yeah. 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 So what are we doing right now? What are we? What are you all doing right now? No, no, are, you you are, are you arguing? Are, are you are you putting what debate? Are you? Yeah, you're putting forward your point of view, and, and you and you and you tend to hello. You tend to justify your 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 opinion and what you think is right. We all want to do that, and I guess we have to be aware that we're doing that. We're not always aware of it, especially when we get right into the middle of a discussion that we have some strong values about. You know, if, if I think something's not fair. I have to watch myself because I can get right into the middle and I can really start to push my point. Mm -hmm. But I need to be aware that I just don't have the, the answer to the whole thing. It's everybody together has the answer. But if I'm sitting, sitting under the leaking ceiling, <laughs> yes. I might have more priority yeah. you know, for things to happen. <laughs> yes, well, and, and that's your, your justifying <laughs> that. Did anybody, what did, where, did anybody put the child at the top of the list? Okay, so what what was the reason behind the child at the top of the list? Oh, no, just regular basis to the child I wanted to try and resist in danger, so that's the individual. Yeah. <laughs> the, the roof I wasn't going to be able to fix, so I wasn't going to be able to do it. Yeah. What do we think of all the people who didn't didn't bother about the child? What do we think of that? We've been mothers. That's one of the child. Why not? Okay, so if I have a mother in the in the group, uh, and the mother, you know, I had one mum say, you know, when I said, who didn't put the child first? And, and all these people put their hands up. She went, oh! Because where she is in her life, that has a real impact, you know, as far as she's concerned, that is priority. So we do shift our priorities, and I, I, I guess it's about you being aware of that. Now, the lady in the blue, and then this lady, yes? <laughs> That's for you. So, so do you in the chamber? Do you, um, uh, you know, get very engaged in discussions about safety? There hasn't been any specific. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is, you're you're saying the ultimate thing here is safety, whereas I don't know what other people think. So, uh, uh, safety might be ultimate to you. What about others? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's interesting because I put the child cried at number five because I presume. Okay, we're listening. Sorry. I presume the child was with a parent. So yeah. what I'm sitting here thinking is I made a presumption and acted in that fashion, and yet the security alarm next door was my second one because I thought maybe that's a fire or maybe that's something yeah. that could then create yeah. further problems. So it's interesting to think that I presumed the kid would be okay because I presumed it was with a parent but security was still my next issue. So thank you. You've just now raised another thing about uh, the presumption or the assumptions that yes. we make. Yes. So the things that we bring into discussions are our values, our own beliefs, people said worldviews, 
and our assumptions. So we tend to sometimes make assumptions that we, and like you're saying, the lady at the back, the counselor at the back, we don't have all the information. And sometimes when we don't have all the information, we tend to make assumptions. And, um, and those assumptions are, are, are very correct yeah. because you say it, you hear a child crying. Now, if you had put that as you hear a child screaming, yeah. for me, that would have been top of the line. Yeah. 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 A so, child crying just means you're late or late night or they're cranky. Yeah. You know, that's a nothing as a mother and a grandmother. <laughs> so <laughs> and everything else that was going on, that's a mother and she was crying. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think, thank you, I think that's where we'll, we'll leave this, this, this part of the, the discussion now. But just uh, one last one, yeah. I was just going to say, as a mayor, I would say that all of those four or five are really in the hands of the, of the mayor. And I'm not going to, as, as a mayor, I'm not going to sit there and ask for somebody to move and second that we uh, <laughs> <laughs> the ceilings. Yes. As a mayor, I'm going to say, okay, we're out of here. <laughs> And, and ultimately, like you're saying, that it is the, the mayor is in charge of the, the yes. chamber. But the idea, the, the idea of the exercise was that every single one of you has a part to play in what happens in the chamber. So what I'm getting, I'm, you know, trying to uh, bring to your consciousness is the, the, the how do you actually do act in the chamber? What is driving you to do make the decisions that you make? Those individual little decisions that you're making all the time. Do I speak to that motion? Do I second that motion? Do I uh, raise an amendment to this motion? Do I agree with that? What do I want to know more about that? You're making those sorts of decisions all the time. And sometimes, um, until you know better, you're making decisions, but you're not really understanding why you're actually making the decisions that you make. And that's part of the work that I do, is actually making people aware of why you're making the decisions that you make. I mean, we, you, I, I, myself, you know, I've grown up where I've had to get in there, thrown in the deep end and do things. And I can tell you that if I had known some of this stuff when I was thrown in the deep end, um, I would have been a, a lot, um, it would have been a lot better for me. So a lot of this, what I'm telling you, is also about your well-being, because some of the t things that happen in the chamber, I don't know if you ever had to go home feeling, oh, no, that wasn't nice. So again, if, you're, if you can understand how you're making the decisions, why you're making them, it does help your own well-being as well, which is a lot of what I'm about. So I'm going to move, move I'm going to leave that sitting with you, and I'm going to move us on to um, the next part. You've got a handout that you can have a look at as I go through the slides. So this is where I want to talk about a decision-focused culture. And again, um, because I see this with, uh, with uh, elected members, with council staff, with organisations across the board. They get so immersed in doing the work, they never get the opportunity to just step back and see how we're actually doing things. Um, so we just get caught up and keep doing stuff. So um, the, um, one of the things I was asked to look at was what makes up a, um, a, a good culture for decision making. And um, there is a paper that we'll give to you to take home and you probably will read tonight as you fall asleep. No, no. But anyway, there, the, there's a paper that um, gives you more information about what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but, so some of the attributes, there are six attributes here. Yeah, six. So the first one is about high aspirations. And that's talking about a fundamental dissatisfaction with the status quo and a desire to make a positive difference. Now. It, that's, uh, I would imagine that what, that's what most of you go, uh, have become councillors for while you're working within local government, that you want to make a difference. And the, the, the thing about, um, thing, you know, are, are things good enough the way they are? 
a, a high performing culture would be looking at how can we continue to make things better. Yeah, things are going good, but how can we keep it, keep it going good? If that's not happening within your culture, if things get bogged down by, within politics, internal politics, um, that's not what a high performing culture should get involved in. So the external focus is the next one, and that is the focus on community reads, needs rather than on internal politics and protecting your own turf. And again, I said there are some times when I do these presentations that people don't talk to me on the way out. But there, it, you, you all probably are aware of, of um, individuals that uh, are in, get into local government because they have a particular <coughs> special interest. And that's all that they will focus on. So the, the thing about your, um, your work is that you are elected by the community and it's about having that focus on what is it that the community um, needs, needs you to be aware of so that you can represent them uh, effectively. If you want to chip in at any stage, please do, because I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. Ask questions or make comments. Um, the next one is the responsibility for council. So you, it's about if you were working in a business, you actually, people, a, a really strong culture is where people feel like they own the business. They, they feel that strongly about it, that they want it to work because they have a sense of ownership within it. Uh, so we're, what we're talking about um, local government, it's, it's not a business, but there's a lot of um, uh, indications that um, business processes are useful within local government. So this is being aware of, you know, if, if you really are um, dedicated to your council, that um, you want to make it work and you realise that it's um, not just your bit that you want to want to make work, you want the whole council to work effectively. Action oriented is the next one. And uh, are my slides, I'm, I'm going through my slides here but I'm not putting them up here, sorry about that, but you've got it in your notes. I'll catch up now. The action oriented bit um, is the focus on getting things done and not getting bogged down in bureaucratic debate. Now, as I say, not getting bogged down in bureaucratic debate, I bet every single one of you can remember a time in the chambers when um, you got right, right bogged down. And, and if, if somebody is very skilled at parliamentary procedure, they can keep you um, going on a debate about something for a long time. I've sat in uh, the chambers where I, I'm in the city of Mitcham and I go and I sit in the gallery and I listen to the debate because I find it very interesting. But I've sat sometimes and thought, how many more times is this item going to be on the council agenda? Um, and it, it can be that. You know, <laughs> so, so how do we how do we stop things from getting bogged down? If that if that's happening, then you know it, you can either let it continue to happen or actually do something about it. Um, the next one is about individuals who learn, um, working out how to bring your personal best to, to the table. And whilst I when I think about that one, um, I'm talking about in the chamber but you, you cannot do your work in the chamber without the work that the council staff do. So it's about how do we get them, you know, ask them the, the questions that you want to know so that you get the best out of them. And what are your skills that you can bring into the chamber that, um, you know, nobody else has? You know, and it could be, um, I do a lot of work around the roles that people play in groups. Uh, and we look at people who are the devil's advocates. Now, not the person who keeps asking, now we did that before, so we're not going to do that again. The devil's advocate is the person that goes, hang on a second, before we go and spend all of this money, have we thought about, uh, do we need to continue to spend money on that once we have spent? So, you know, those sorts of things. If that's your skill, um, to be able to bring that into the chamber. There's all sorts of other skills that I'm sure you're aware of. And then the this, uh, uh, next one is an openness to change. So not getting bogged down in old ways and being open to innovation. And again, one of the things within local government is there are people who dedicate themselves to, to local government. And I, when I was at the city of Charles Sturt, the mayor there was, was Harold Anderson. Her Harold had been there for about 30 years. And um, he used to come up uh, to where I worked. There was three. There was myself, a community engagement officer, um, a communications officer, and a graphic designer. And he called us his girls. 
And he came up, and because we were all fairly youngish, uh, he got a lot of value out of talking to us. And so he would uh, want to know what are the new ideas. He didn't want, you know, and he got bogged down in some old, old practices, as, as we all do. But it's about um, how do we look at what is needed to keep the, your council vital, to keep your council uh, sustainable, and to keep you moving into the future. So they're the attributes that um, you know we need to be thinking about as, as you do your work in council. What I wanted to do is give you an activity. And I'm not sure. So, uh, okay. Don't get about that one. So I might ask Kathy and uh, Liz to help hand these out. Um, here's an opportunity for you to have a slow down and have a discussion about those um, attributes that I've just been talking about. Thank you. Yeah, one each. So Liz is handing out a, um, a sheet. And at your tables, I'm going to encourage you to have a look at, have a think about those attributes that I've just been through. And if you can give, ex uh, if you can write down examples of where, how this is happening in your council. If you can write down an example, Think about what it is that you might need to do to make to to um, ingrain that ad attribute within your council. So once we've handed it out, I'll take some questions if anybody has any questions about what we're about to do. But I'll tell you again. <coughs> So as you can see listed on there are those, um, those six attributes and it asks you to think, can you think of an example of that attribute at work in your council? And if you can't, what, what do you think you might want to do to make sure that attribute starts to be um, addressed and, and, and brought alive within your council? So have a, have a discussion at your table and share the examples or um, yeah, see what happens. Over to you. But we'll give you ten minutes of that. I'm just going to ask for one or two examples or, or comments. Um, I, we have a very short you know, amount of time to do a lot. There is a couple more things that I want to get through before we uh, finish up. Um, so just any comments on that activity that you have? I, I have been talking to a few people, which I'll talk to after the session. But any, any comments? I, I would just say one of the conclusions or assumptions I just made is that um, to a certain extent it's very difficult for me to be terribly negative about any of these things simply because if we're here we're sort of councillors for a starter who are doing or <coughs> attempting to be part of this sort of yep. council culture yep. and we're here to try and be part of that so it's very difficult therefore to sort of move away and try and find because then you're thinking well what does somebody else think and then you make them think so 
I think this seems to be the way that all, co all councils should be focusing and working towards, yeah. but I believe that that's what we're trying to do. And so mm -hmm. it's very hard to come up with examples of yeah, and while, while, while you raise that, I, I really think, you know, you're, you've, you've raised a really important point that the people that are here, you know, we don't acknowledge the good things that happen in local government, so I, I think give yourselves a big round of applause for actually being here. <laughs> and I, I, I so agree with what you're saying, uh, and the thing is that... Um, if you, if you don't step back from this sometimes and, and bring it into the chamber, you know, it, find somewhere within your business, uh, in, in your um, council meetings, or even if it's an extraordinary one, every now and again, to touch base on, on the health of the culture within your, your council. Um, and to, to, if you, I, I've been, you know, I know I've been around local government enough, if you say um, we're going to have an extraordinary meeting to talk about the culture, those people that aren't here won't turn up. But if it becomes part of your regular business session, it, it, it's, it's very much worth it to actually bring it in as part of your business sessions, that you touch, uh, touch based on, the, on the, the health and the culture of, of the organisation. That's something for you to think about and take back. Yeah. Just one moment, we're talking about this from a council related that the culture of a council is its administration as well yes. as the elected members. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you do find is a constant, constant tension is the relationship between elected members and administration. Yeah. How to bring the culture together so that we're all pulling in the same direction sometimes. Is yeah. the well, within the time I've got left, let me give you at least one thing to think about. So this is um, uh, the, as I said, when you're in the chamber, a lot of the decisions that you're being asked to make are based on uh, reports that are provided by the um, council officers that you've asked them to go out and engage with their communities and that's what they do. Now, what I'm teaching them is to follow a decision-making process and this is what they, they follow. So this is a very generic decision-making process and um, it, it's quite logical but it's also really interesting when I first ask staff, can you map out for me how you go about a project? And if I have, if I, what I was hoping that we'd have time for was to put a piece of butcher's paper on all of these tables and say to you, map me out how you go about uh, making a decision. And I would guarantee that we would have a different version at every table because people have different ways of getting from A to B. So I teach this decision-making process and it's, it's very much project management based. So the first thing is you've got to know what you're dealing with. Scope the project. What is it that we're actually wanting to do here? And once we're clear about that, the next thing we do is what information do we need to be able to do this? So we start gathering information. Uh, it should be from you know, the, your, the elected members, from the community, from staff, from other agencies, from reports, all that sort of stuff. Once we've got that, we've got this whole lot of information and now what do we do with it? So we need to set up decision-making criteria. Now if it's in relation to the engagement on a reserve, we need to look at safety, for example. We need to look at um, agility, um, the environment, um, uh, all sorts of things. So we, we, we set up decision-making criteria and then we take all the information that we've gathered in the next step and we start to develop options. So we, we get all the information and we sit it under these criteria that we've established. Which, and then we've got some options. So we can look at, we, we could do this with the reserve, that with the reserve, or that, that with the reserve, not that. Um, and then we review the options. We might uh, go, go back to staff or go back to the community and say, which, which one of these options do you like? And then the staff, look at the one that is most uh, popular with the community, take it back to you, you make a decision. That's how it works, generally. And it's generally when, before I start teaching people about community engagement, it's at this point where all this work has been done that they say, let's check in with the public about this, with the stakeholders. And that's when we end up with what we call the dad situation. Dad is decide, announce, and defend. Yeah? So if, if it's you know, if the 
public really feel about something, your residents feel really strongly about a reserve, if you wanted to rip it up and start again, they're going to come out, unless you've involved them in the process, they're going to come out at you. So, the, this is when community engagement, uh, the focus is an afterthought. We've made all these decisions, then we ask the public. I sometimes think that um, the staff are actually doing that, and the councillors are the stakeholders, and then the staff are doing the deciding when that's an independent. I, I, I don't always think yeah. that councillors get brought in early on. Often there's a, a lot of information <coughs> in the report given to yeah. us, and they've already decided what they want to do. And yes. they sway us through the crisis. Which you comes back to what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So, so this is where the culture of an organisation, it's got to involve everybody, as you're saying. Yeah. And what we're talking about is actually having a, a, a community engagement or even a stakeholder focus at every step of a, of a decision-making process. So as you've just you know, in, pointed out, at the beginning of a project, um, the... Um, Council officers are being asked to think, what is it that you want at that point? What is it that you need to know? So it could be that they would um, send you a briefing that says, we are looking at um, uh, upgrading this reserve, uh, and it's in your ward. What do you think about it? What do you know that the community you know, tells you about this reserve? Do you see lots of people going there? They need to tap into what you know about that particular reserve. They also, at that point, need to let the public know, we've been looking at this reserve, it's looking really tired, uh, the equipment's you know, no longer safe for the kids. Over the next three months or so, we're going to be looking at what we might do with this reserve. So they're not making any commitment, but they're actually flagging that they're, they're starting to look at something. So then people can say, well, if you're gonna do anything that reserve, I wanna be part of that. So people get the opportunity to get involved before uh, right down the bottom, you know, because quite sometimes staff will say to me, "Oh no, we can't tell them too early; they'll they'll sabotage it. They'll sabotage yeah. it at any one of those points. The earlier you get people know what you're trying to do, then they can start to work with you. Now they might not always agree with you, as we discovered in our first uh, opening activity. Not everybody's going to agree, but knowing that, that's why we have to bring people together as early as possible." So it, with the community engagement work that I'm teaching the staff around decision making, it's about involving all the stakeholders at every stage of that decision process. Not wait until you're way down there when you've missed all this rich information. So ex for example, <coughs> data gathering. Again, when they're <coughs> gathering the data, they need to tap into your knowledge base around you know, what, what goes on at that reserve. What was the history? Why did that reserve get put there in the first place? And I've come across ones where, you know, somebody's father came back from the, the war and they planted all these trees in this area uh, and it was dedicated to that memory. Well, and over the years, records have been lost and they've forgotten. But you might have that knowledge and that's important. And the staff might know that there might be some contaminated soil there. You know, what, what do, what do all, you know, all the people that might be involved in this know? And if we don't ask at those stages, we're going to miss information. And by the time we get down to there, when you're trying to make a decision, the decision doesn't stick because we haven't, we haven't had all the facts, all the information. So, this is, uh, the other thing that's involved in this type of process is some marketing principles. Now, when I say marketing principles, I'm not talking about spinning the community or spinning any of you. In, with marketing principles, they say it takes three times people to hear something three times before they will actually start to take notice of it. So the first notice that goes out to you to say, we're looking at this reserve, you know, what, do you, what would you like us to bear in mind when we're looking at this? The next note, briefing or request comes to you, what information do you have on this reserve? The third one is that we've started to now work with the community reference group to help us establish the decision criteria. Do you want to come along and talk to this group? So we've the third message. Now you know, it's in your head, this is really starting to happen. And the community knows it too because they would be getting those messages. By the time they get down to here, um, they've been brought along in the process. And I use what I call storyboards. So if somebody hasn't heard about a project until we get down to there, I'll, I'll, you know the cork loop that you use for your election signs? I will put the story on boards around the room 
so that when people come in and try to say, we didn't know anything about this, there it is, this is what we've been trying to involve you in. And it's an evidence-based process as well, because the other thing that you get if you don't follow a decision-making process like this is requests for uh, freedom of information and complaints to the ombudsman. When you follow a process like this, you just give all your uh, information to the ombudsman. We're good. Okay. <coughs> well, I think I've run out of time, have I, Liz? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So, any any questions or, or comments around that? What do you think? Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. I think it's been uh, insightful. Um, I just thought I'd like to take you up on a little issue. You said um, you said earlier, council is not a business. Oh no, I said councils are um, encouraged to act like a business, <coughs> and, and and I'm not. Yeah, but go on. Well, um, I, I would I would um, I would purport. But they actually are business, and they are big business. Yeah. And I think it, I think it's it's beholden on, on all of us as elected members and and, and you know if there's council administration and representatives as well to act in a way that's in the best interest of that business, and that business is providing services and facilities to yeah. the community. Yeah. And uh, so and, 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 and it is big business. Yeah. You know? And we we've seen that already in the, in the presentations that preceded you. Um, you know, we're talking about a, a big part of the economy, a big yeah. part of the workforce. Um, and, I th and I think um, you know we really ought to think about how we engage with our fellow <coughs> councillors in a, in a constructive, mm. uh, progressive way. Yeah. And, uh, so I think that your presentation is um, really good to give us those sorts of ideas. So thank right. you. Thank you. And and I I, I I was again I always pick my language very carefully. And so um, that attribute where it says responsibility for council, I actually reworded it a bit because I didn't want to come straight out and say, you've got to own this business because I know there will be some of you in the room that don't see council as a business because sometimes people think of business as churn and product, whereas in, with council we're talking about people uh, and the community. But yeah, I, I think for efficiencies, uh, running a council as a business is, is an absolute must, I think, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, thank you. I was going to make the comment that um, the, the whole part of local government is uh, originally you're actually um, um, elected by, um, by the community to make decisions on behalf of everyone. I think the important part that we've got through is, is teamwork between the administration and also the Workshops and whatever, and uh, and then uh, you come to that final decision-making process, which is in the actual council meeting. Yeah. A lot of the debate should have been uh, should, uh, should have been done in the, in the workshops or information sessions, mm. you know, with the uh, uh, informal with the with the elected members. Yeah. And, I, and I think the informal meetings are very important for the elected members. Uh, in, in our case, when we have a workshop. We refer them by their Christian name instead of the board. And there is no minutes, there's nothing, but it's at the start then get uh, the, the idea of the, the general direction that the, the elected members would go, would go to. Then once you actually get in there and make those decisions in the, in the council meeting, from there on, that's the decision of the council. Mm -hmm. It is, and I, I, I find it rather frustrating when I read some of the metropolitan papers where councillor so and so has actually. I didn't agree with the decision, something or other, and, and it's, I, I, I blame the media for it quite a bit because they, they want to go out and find out somebody you know, that doesn't agree with, with the decisions. Mm. And I think it's, uh, 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 you know, you, you're elected to represent the community and you actually need to actually, um, uh, you know, once that decision's made, that's the, the decision of the council and yeah. it's been through all the debate, etc. Yeah. So Look, thank you so much. I, I totally agree with all that. Um, I, I want to just finish off by, by telling you a little bit of a, a story. And again, you know, you might like it or you might not. But what you've been uh, talking about is um, 
something that I, I really would love to see happen more of. I, I get to travel around South Australia and I love going to the um, regional councils because you, know, you, 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 you can have dinner with the council um, either before, and some of the metro councils do it, but you know, and so I love some of the uh, regional councils where you go and have lunch and then you, know, you have the, uh, um, the council meetings. And the staff do get to talk to the elected members, which there isn't that divide. But one of the things that, um, when we developed up the Community Engagement Handbook, uh, the, um, Chris Russell, one of the things that I said to Chris, uh, Chris right at the beginning was, we can't just develop a handbook and then leave it sitting on shelves. We have to develop a training program that teaches the staff how to actually use this. Uh, not just staff, but everybody in local government. Now, within the seven years that we've been delivering this, I think it's seven years, I had a knock on the head last week, I'm sorry, my numbers are a bit off, but within that time that we've been delivering this training, we have had two elected members in the training room. I would love for even to have you in the <coughs> training room so that we can show you what the staff are being taught to do because they need your support to be able to do the work that they do and you need their support. And I, I, I've tried, and, and Liz would probably know this, um, we've um, looked at a number of ways that we could offer this training for you because there is an acknowledgement of how much work you are already doing and how much time you give to local government. Um, what I've been, uh, did recently in Mojura with the elected mm -hmm. members, rather than do a training session for them, I held an information uh, conversation with them. <coughs> and they got to tell me what they are frustrated about around community engagement what they don't understand that the staff are doing, so I could explain to them what the staff are doing, and then I said to them, what do you need the staff to do in relation to community engagement? They told me so that I could pass that on to the staff during training, and then I said, what do you, do you need for the, 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 the staff to know? Anyway, I was saying, what do you need from each other, basically? And um, so that's, that's you know, a, a really important point that you've raised, that opportunity for staff and council to actually really start to collaborate. Yeah, and they're not better because Sue, Liz is where Sorry, I was just picking up on that point. Uh, at our council, and it may well be other councils, there tends to be uh, a, a culture of them and us at times between the administration and the elected members. And often trying to bridge that gap or to try and find commonality is difficult to do because everyone's coming from their own perspective and uh, defensive. Yep. But I mean, for example, going through the process that you've done today, where we're working together to try and find the way to achieve the decision, may break down some of those barriers because we're all focusing in the same direction rather than yep. taking our own opposing views. Yep. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. quite possibly a good, yep. yeah, mm -hmm. a good solution. Thank you for your attention and um, yep. um, have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>